some people were uh, asking me about what is the connection between tube convection and uh, relay teller instability. So essentially, relay teller instability, you have a heavier fluid or a lighter fluid initially, and you remove this barrier, and that uh, because of the density gradient, you get instability, and <coughs> with time, this mixing zone will keep increasing. Whereas in tube convection, what we have is a continuous source of buoyancy difference. So you get continuously, uh, essentially, uh, high density fluid here and low density fluid here and you get steady convection so in in some respects this zone is sort of similar but uh, it's mostly different uh, and the other difference of course is that uh, it is laterally confined in tube convection whereas in typically in uh, relative instability it's quite wide <clears throat> but yeah there are certain uh, similarities especially probably in the mixing uh, zone in the two cases. So one of the probably uh, uh, nice things about this flow is one can use it to develop uh, turbulence models for buoyancy driven flows. And uh, the other important uh, thing which I didn't mention is that at the wall essentially you have zero mean flow turbulence. Uh, which is interacting with the wall. So that is a Yes, but at later time, in this mixing zone, uh, it's again this density gradient which is driving the, the flow. <clears throat> so, yeah, sort of. So on the wall itself, you have uh, of course, uh, zero uh, flow, but the mean flow itself is zero. So it's uh, it is zero mean flow turbulence next to a wall. So that's an important fundamental problem. Uh, and people have looked at in, for example, in wind tunnels, they create grid turbulence, and there is a plate or a belt which keeps moving with the same velocity as the uh, free stream velocity. But there the with distance, the turbulence dies down. Whereas in this case, the turbulence is sustained. So next to the wall, you have this uh, highly turbulent sustained uh, flow, uh, which uh, can be looked at both from a fundamental viewpoint as well as from a modeling viewpoint. So one of the things which Mahindra asked me to just briefly talk on is about the boundary layers in uh, relay Bernard convection. Uh, as I said, uh, it is still unresolved topic and uh, so there are a lot of controversy on what boundary layers are and what is the role. Uh, so I'll just briefly talk about that. And as I said, it's more a personal viewpoint. <clears throat> so my view is that convection on any horizontal surface is basically uh, due to these near wall plumes. Whether it is on a uh, isolated plate like this, you have a hot plate. And what you have is essentially uh, far away from the plate, you have a turbulent plume. But near the surface, if the Rayleigh number is high enough, you'll get these plumes uh, just like in Rayleigh Bernard convection. So the outer flow here is very different from here. But near the wall, it's identical. So in the same sense that next to a wall in turbulent pipe flow, turbulent channel flow, turbulent boundary layers, the flow looks almost alike. It's sort of universal. So in that sense, the turbulent convection on a horizontal surface in different uh, situations near the wall would be similar. The outer flow, of course, would be different. So in the case of relevant convection, you have these two plates, and then you have this um, outer flow. And uh, <coughs> so you have these plumes on, on either plate, essentially. So uh, as I said, it is determined by plumes, the flow dynamics and the heat transfer. The <coughs> 
character of the new near wall flow can change with the Rayleigh number and aspect ratio. Uh, so you get, as I showed earlier, a cell type of uh, structure at low RA. And as RA increases, the strength of the outer flow starts increasing and the plumes start getting affected by that. And uh, so the outer flow can either align the plumes in the flow direction and uh, or they can convect the near, uh, near wall plumes. So in fact, if you see pictures of uh, uh, a heated plate on which you have mild flow, all the plumes will get aligned with the flow. And even in atmospheric flows, uh, that's what happens. All the convection rolls get, get aligned with the, with the mean wind. And plumes are essentially caused by instability. So it's just like you have a layer of uh, a film of water on a sajja. And so that is unstable. So you start getting these droplets. Or, or drops or continuous streams. So these are essentially like plumes. And the cause is, again, in both cases, is due to instability. So <clears throat> there is a very famous and popular model called Howard's model for convection next to a surface. So what he said was that uh, periodically, basically, you get a on a hot plate, the conduction layer keeps growing with time. At a certain critical height or critical thickness of that layer, it becomes unstable and it erupts into a thermal. So that was Howard's model. But uh, experiments show that it's essentially you have plumes. So what we proposed was a spatial equivalent of Howard's model. So basically you have locally uh, boundary layer growing, at some distance it becomes unstable and you get a sheet plume. So the difference between Howard's model and this model is, in Howard's model it's a periodic or time dependent eruption of uh, hot fluid, whereas here it is spatially you are getting hot fluid rising along these sheet plumes. And uh, so one can give an average plume spacing, say lambda. And uh, uh, we found that basically the plume spacing decreases as you increase the heat flux. And if you look at RA, actually this would be RA lambda to the power of one third, uh, goes like around 50 for plant number one. So this basically is uh, trying to understand why these plumes form. And uh, as I said, similar to turbulent boundary layers, you can define near wall scales and outer scales. So the near wall scales actually originally was proposed by Townsend for based on the heat flux. So just like in turbulent boundary layers, you can base your near wall uh, scale based on the shear stress or the momentum flux. So another way to do it is to see the heat flux is not known a priori. But what is known is the temperature difference. So one can just through dimensional analysis, knowing the temperature difference, you can get the near wall velocity scale and the length scale, taking into account the viscosity and the thermal diffusivity. So these are just uh, dimensional arguments. You get the velocity scale and uh, the length scale, near wall length scale. And for the outer scales, uh, Deardorff long back had proposed this, that is outer flow should scale like uh, uh, in this way related to the heat flux. And uh, it goes like uh, the overall height to the power of one third. And for some reason, I think the current literature or current scientists have forgotten about these classical works and uh, which uh, really should be because uh, both these scales are never mentioned. No, no, when it, huh? Ah. 
So it will boil down to the same thing. No? This is heat flux, kinematic heat flux. So this is heat flux, this is uh, thermal diffusivity and uh, beta is the expansion coefficient. Reynolds number, it will be of the order of 1, I would imagine, yes. So, the plume spacing essentially goes like uh, 1 over delta t to the power of 1 third or heat flux to the power of 1 fourth. And in fact, we looked at uh, data from the barrel of Elmeno, El right? Uh, and uh, tried to use that scaling like z over zw and the mean velocity divided by the DRO velocity scale. So, this is for uh, aspect ratio 1 and uh, different uh, rally numbers. And you can see that there's pretty good uh, collapse. And similarly, if you look at the velocity fluctuations, so you can see that this is normalized by the Diodorov scale, whereas the vertical uh, velocity is normalized by the viscous scale because this mean flow is driven by the outer scale, whereas what is happening near the wall is driven by the viscous scale. <clears throat> and again, the velocity fluctuations in the lateral direction, again, they collapse reasonably well. This, this, uh, so, we are trying to develop a boundary layer model taking into account this uh, effect. So, Boundary layers in RB convection, uh, there have been a whole lot of different proposals. So, starting with, you know, Prantl Blasius, like Stevens mentioned, and uh, Prantl Blasius with pressure gradient. And in fact, uh, there's been some uh, attempt at dynamic scaling, that is, at each instant of time you re uh, normalize. But still, uh, it's not very convincing because it is not laminar flow really. It, I mean, the profile looks sort of like frontal blasius, but there's a lot of controversy still. And in fact, um, the more recent papers like Siskina, they're trying to incorporate the turbulence in the um, boundary layer model itself. And but the fact remains that uh, you know, even at uh, lower like 10 power 7 the flow near the wall is certainly not laminar. It is fluctuating all the time and uh, it depends on your point of view whether you would want to call it turbulent or not. But it is viscous, but it is highly fluctuating. So, <clears throat> and of course, as the outer flow becomes stronger, as the Rayleigh number increases, then the effect of the outer flow will start playing a role. And the main point is that these turbulent fluctuations cannot be ignored in the momentum transfer transport near the wall because, uh, you know, it's not diffusive. Prantl uh, Blasius boundary layer is basically diffusive transport. And in fact, uh, measurements for in that same barrel at Rayleigh number of not very high, 10 part 10, they show that it is highly turbulent fluctuations at uh, uh, this Rayleigh number as well. So, of course, this question is uh, uh, what happens as you keep increasing the Rayleigh number, as Stephen mentioned that uh, uh, there's a prediction that you get this ultimate regime where Nusselt number goes like Ra to the power of half. And so, the implication is that when you have So, Q is independent of height, if you have Ra to the power of one third. That is, the heat flux becomes independent of height. And when Nusselt number goes like 
Ra into Pr to the power of half, then Q becomes independent of viscosity and diffusivity. So these two limits basically, which means that at this very high Rayleigh numbers, if this uh, scaling is followed, it becomes independent of uh, 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 thermal diffusivity and viscosity. So of course, this controversy still remains whether uh, experiments have shown this uh, regime. So there is some evidence, maybe it is starting to happen at uh, 10 power 17 or so, I think. <clears throat> but again, like I mentioned earlier, but even before the ultimate regime, the boundary layers are turbulent, maybe of a different type. Well, if you, for example, look at uh, the temperature signal, and uh, if you put a, a temperature probe very close to the wall, you will see a lot of uh, fluctuations in temperature or fluctuations in heat flux. So I, th I think the main thing is one should distinguish between viscous flow and uh, laminar flow. So viscous flow means the Reynolds number is small, which is true, but it doesn't mean that it is laminar. For example, again in a turbulent boundary layer, the Reynolds number based on the sublayer thickness will be small, but you get huge fluctuations in the turbulent uh, wall shear stress, for example. So it depends on how you define uh, uh, turbulent in, turbulence in that way. So probably what happens when you go to the ultimate regime is that you, know, you start going from a mixed convection type of regime to a forced convection type of regime. So Uh, what goes from laminar to turbulent? See, that's what I'm saying. Even at very low Rayleigh numbers, the convection itself is turbulent beyond 10 past 7. Right? But what do you mean by laminar? Linearly, it will be increasing for all turbulent flows also, because the, you know it has to go to zero at the wall. So it has to linearly increase, right? If you go close enough. Conduction, even if you go to the ultimate regime, the heat transfer has to take by conduction at the wall, because it, all the fluctuations die out at the wall. So the final transport process is by diffusion, both as far as wall shear stress is concerned or heat transfer is concerned at a surface. Even if you take a Rayleigh number of 100 million, at the surface, the heat transfer will be by diffusion. It will be given by K into dt dz at z equal to 0 at that instant of time. So that's why it is uh, highly viscous near the wall, but it doesn't mean that it is laminar. See, there are so many things uh, which, uh, I mean, uh, see, first of all, it's not a boundary layer in, this, in the sense that there is no starting point. Okay? So if you look at uh, aspect ratio one cell, there is no, I mean, if you think of boundary layer as a layer of vorticity, so here the same fluid is going around. So there is no starting point. So you cannot really give a X value from which it starts growing. Because on the side wall itself, you will have a boundary layer, which impinges and then, so it, it, to begin with, it has a finite uh, thickness. And on top of that, uh, you have all these fluctuations in velocity due to the plumes, which makes it uh, non-laminar. Kolmogorov scale is again a viscous scale, right? So 
So within an isotropic turbulence, for example, the smallest scale will be the Kolmogorov scale. And here, the smallest scale near the wall, again, will be of the Reynolds number one. So both these scales, Kolmogorov scale and this, probably will be of the same order. <coughs> near the wall. I won't expect. It doesn't mean that if you have an inertial range, it is turbulent, no? See, this inertial range business is only for isotropic turbulence. So people are, you know, expanding it to all sorts of other things, where it may not really, because if you look at the assumptions, right? See, for example, if you look at turbulent production, right? It happens at the large scales and then it scales, I mean, it uh, goes down the cascade. But near the wall, it's totally different. So the basic assumption of inertial scaling won't hold here at all. So I'll tell you what uh, I mean. Our view is: so if you take a, a small plate which is heated, right, and the Rayleigh number is small enough, then you get something like this. The whole thing is laminar because of buoyancy. You get a flow like this, and then it. So that is like a plume. That's what you'll see. In a, but in a turbulent uh, Raleigh Bernard convection. So you have so you have flow impinging like this. So then you'll get some sort of stagnation point, and the boundary layer will grow, and then it will at this point. If I call this say some delta critical. So when R A delta critical or R A delta is equal to R A delta critical, it becomes a plume. So this whole fluid which is coming from the core, it hits this boundary layer, that's where the heat transfer takes place. And then it moves sidewards. And because of instability, it becomes a plume. Even in numerical simulations, you will see sort of here the flow coming inwards, and then you'll have a layer here, and the flow after impinging has to move sidewards, and the locally the boundary layer will grow. So this is basically a free convection boundary layer, and on top of this you have the boundary layer due to the outer flow, and you know, that is what people are talking about. Uh, these are boundary layers within that main boundary layer in some sense. Whereas Howard's theory was, uh, I mean, essentially like this. What he said was, with time, This conduction layer grows, and when this thickness becomes equal to the critical thickness, then you get a plume or a thermal which comes out of the plume. In fact, in that original Sparrows experiment, which I showed the thymol blue, they had this periodic eruption of thermals. So, it, under certain conditions, it looks like you get this periodic eruption, and certain conditions, you get more like sheet plumes. And which also depends on Prandtl number. So this is the PIV uh, data, which is made into a movie, basically. And you can see in the in this is in tube convection in the middle section of the tube. And you can see it's continuously evolving, and uh, <clears throat> you get these high regions of high vorticity. And uh, clearly, you can see there is no mean flow.
So this is the shadow graph experiment uh, again. So again, it you see that it is axially homogeneous, and these very fine scale uh, structures are due to very large gradients you get because partly because it is a high Prandtl number or high Schmidt number case. And the large numbers of these structures is because it's an integrated effect. <clears throat> Sometimes you see this type of whirls which happen. <clears throat> This is the same shadow graph experiment with uh, instead of salt, it's with heat. So you can see that it is, of course, the turbulence is much weaker here. And since the Prandtl number is around six, the gradients also will be much weaker. Again, of course, you see that. Uh, so one of the things here is that the length scale, the only length scale here is the diameter. Unlike in raleigh Bernard convection where it is the height, here it's, it's a very long tube and the only length scale is the diameter. So everything, all the structures basically scale with the diameter. <clears throat> This is uh, particles in again in tube convection. This is with uh, heat. So it's basically continuously churning. So, so sometimes you see this uh, essentially heavier fluid coming down and lighter fluid going up. But many times you get a lot of uh, for example, here, there's two masses colliding with each other. And in fact, that's how, uh, if you look at the turbulent kinetic energy equation, the kinetic energy is generated due to buoyancy in the vertical direction. And due to collisions, it gets transferred to the lateral direction. This is the uh, cliff or laser induced fluorescence uh, movie. <clears throat> so, as I said, the brighter fluid is the heavier fluid, which is put on the top tank, the fluorescein dye. You get very nice uh, patterns. Compared to raleigh bernard convection, the turbulence here is much stronger for the same density difference and the same apparatus size. So the, both the heat flux and the turbulence levels or the Reynolds number will be much higher. <clears throat> so in some sense, this is a good flow field to study because it is axially homogeneous. So just like in a you know, pressure driven pipe flow.
Well, uh, one actually some, there was some work done in this type of system by you know people who look at ventilation. So supposing you have two rooms which are connected by a staircase, and there is no other uh, place for the uh, air to enter. So essentially, you have two rooms like the two tanks, and the staircase in between is like the tube. So I mean, that is one example. But uh, chimney will be different because in a chimney the flow comes. I mean, there is flow can come from below and then it can go through. So there is a mean flow there, but here the mean flow is absent. <clears throat> so finally, I will show uh, not ours, but. Uh, Nice uh, Schlieren picture taken by Gary Settles. So this is a Schlieren visualization. And one of the reasons I wanted to show this was that you can create turbulence very easily. With very little temperature difference, you get uh, <clears throat> The other important fluid mechanical concept is here, where a person is breathing out and breathing in. <clears throat> so you can see there's a huge difference between breathing out and breathing in. When you're breathing out, the flow comes out like a jet. But when you're breathing in, the flow comes out from all around. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Uh, In your simulations, is it? Okay. That is a model, I mean, that's the simplest model, like, uh, like a periodic array. But <clears throat> yeah, one, I think it might be worthwhile looking at those uh, pictures in more detail just to see what type of uh, situation you get when the plumes actually form in an actual numerical simulation. Whether, I mean, any of this, this is a hypothesis, right, whether it holds. <clears throat> Any other questions? 